Good morning, I'm Kathleen Vogelsang. I'm president of the Seidman College of Business Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome each and every one of you this morning. Thanks for braving our soggy weather to, to come out, but you will not be disappointed, I assure you. This is our last breakfast of the academic year. I hope you've enjoyed our, the speakers that we've presented this year, and we are very excited about next year's speakers also. Um, I also hope that you have enjoyed the opportunity to network with others in the community. Um, we try and make that part of our breakfast. Um, our next breakfast is September 29th. Um, it will feature the athletic director of Grand Valley State University, Tim Selgo. So hopefully you will be able to join us. Um, if you are not on our mailing list, please, um, if you could leave your email address with somebody at the table out in the lobby, we'd be happy to put you on our mailing list so that you'll get uh, notices of all of our events. At this time, I'd also like to acknowledge a special guest we have in our audience, the president of Grand Valley State University, Tom Haas. Thanks for joining us, Tom. It's now my pleasure to introduce Carol Lepucky. Carol is the State Director of the Michigan Network of Small Business and Technology Development Centers, which is housed in the Seton College of Business. The Small Business and Technology Center is a partner program of the U U.S. Small Business Administration with 12 regional and 30 satellite offices statewide. Carol will now present the West Michigan businesses that were recently honored by Ge Governor Granholm. Thank you very much, Kathy. And I would ask that um, Dean H. James Williams and Dante Villarreal please join me on stage. We're very, very pleased today to recognize local West Michigan companies who received awards at a recent event at the end of April, uh, Michigan Celebrates Small Business, uh, an event that uh, honors the companies who are the backbone of this local and state economy. They're the job creators. They create growth and economic spurring of a lot of energy in our community. It's our distinct pleasure this morning to recognize these local companies. I'd ask that they please join me on stage. I'll take a moment to talk about the first group which is our 50 companies to watch. Um, this was started, this is our sixth year of making a recognition of 50 companies who are in a growth spurt in Michigan. And let's think about that. During this economy, we're recognizing companies who are seeing 20% growth a year, adding employees and contributing to a uh, growth of businesses that are adding on employees during a time at which our state is in a very interesting scenario. So this is uh, a year in year six of this uh, entity called Michigan Celebrate Small Business that we looked at companies that were growing and thought to ourselves, are we going to have a pipeline anymore in this tough economy? And we found ourselves saying yes. I'd like to please first recognize Atomic Object LLC President Carl Erickson. Founded in 2000, hold it until I give you just a little brief piece. Founded in 2001, Atomic Objects specializes in custom production software. The company distinguishes itself with its ability to work in multiple domains, technologies, and industry segments. In 2006, Atomic Object won its first out-of-state client. <clears throat> Since then, the company has aggressively expanded its out-of-state clientele with 45% of 2009 annual revenue coming from out-state of Michigan. Join me in congratulating Carl Erickson. <laughs> Our second company to watch, the C2 Group, CEO Michael Seaton. As a provider of web and video production services, the C2 Group has found success with its focus on specialty niches. Following this approach, the company has achieved double-digit percentage growth in annual revenue and more than doubled its staff since 2006. Please congratulate Michael Seaton. Okay. Our third company to watch, Dorner Works Limited, President David Dorner. Dorner Works provides clients with full-service design solutions, taking them from an electronic system idea to a robust product that has been tested and is ready for manufacturing. The company has expanded its client base from the aerospace industry to include the medical market, which has fueled much recent growth. Congratulations, David Dorner. <laughs> On to 
unable to join us today, but please let's celebrate in their absence, Heat Transfer International, President David Prouty. Heat Transfer International operates renewable energy power plants that use gasification to convert organic waste to energy. President David Prouty views the utilization of waste products to create energy as a key to creating a healthier environment. The company recently received a state grant to build a test center where it can test various wastes and learn which recipes, recipes, create the most efficient energy. Congratulations, David Prouty. And our last of the 50 companies to watch, our own Lambert Edwards and Associates President and Managing Partner, um, Jeffrey Lambert. Founded, founded in 1998, Lambert Edwards & Associates specializes in public relations and investor relations. Headquartered in Grand Rapids with offices in Lansing and Detroit, LENA has more than 100 clients in 20 states and five countries. The agency serves middle market companies and is organized into five practice areas, automotive, uh, consumers, uh, financial communications, health and, care, health and technology, and public affairs. Congratulations, Jeffrey Lambert. Next, we are recognizing two companies, the first of which is unable to join us, but the U.S. Small Business Administration at this Michigan Celebrates events recognizes, and I want you to think about how many recognized companies we have here in West Michigan out of, uh, out of the group. Uh, Charles Reed, owner of Char Charter Innovation, excuse me, Charter House Innovations. Charter House Innovations is the largest in-house design firm in West Michigan, specializing in seating and decor for restaurants, hotels, and universities. Since per Purchasing Charter House Innovations in 2004, Charles Reed has led the company to expand its client list to over 20 chains, universities, hotels, and conference centers, as well as increase revenues and create over 100 jobs in West Michigan. Let's clap for those 100 jobs. <laughs> A very heartfelt one uh, to many of us uh, in this room. Michigan, uh, they received not just a Michigan award, but the Midwest Award for SBA. So awards go from a Michigan, a state level, to a regional, and then to the national level. Uh, receiving the Jeffrey Butlin Family Owned Business of the Year awards would be De uh, DeWitt Barrels Incorporated. DeWitt Barrels has been a family owned industrial container reconditioner for more than 100 years. The company owns a fleet of over 200 vehicles and delivers to markets in Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Currently, DeWitt Barrels is owned by its fifth generation DeWitts, Peter, Michael, and Tim, and operated by the three brothers along with a sixth generation family member, Peter Jason DeWitt. I was there the moment that they got the award, the moment that the governor um, talked to them about the impact that they've had in Michigan, and it was touching. This is one of those stories of West Michigan. Let's have a great round of applause. And our final award this evening is our own Small Business and Technology Region 7. Dante Villarreal is our director of that office. And uh, I would like to recognize Florisa Janatis, um, owner of the Man Management Business Solutions, Inc. Management Business Solutions is a talent recruitment firm specializing in middle and upper management positions. With its emphasis on diversity and inclusion recruitment, the firm has experienced rapid growth since its beginning in 2007 and is becoming one of the players in the industry. Management Business Solutions is located in downtown Grand Rapids and has grown to six employees. Congratulations. I'd like to turn this back over to Kathy, but I'd also like to give all of our awardees one last applause. Congratulations. Thanks, Carol. And I'd like to add my congratulations to all the businesses, too. Um, we have so much to be proud of here in West Michigan. On behalf of the Seidman College of Business Alumni Association, I am very pleased to welcome back Birgit Close to give her annual State of the Region Seidman Breakfast Series address. With all the challenges facing Michigan, 
we need some long-term solutions to fix our problems. Birgit will share her perspective on how we can begin to move to a more sustainable economy in our state. Birgit Close can be, has been president of The Right Place since 1987. The Right Place is a regional nonprofit economic development organization promoting economic growth in, West Mich in the West Michigan region. It's my pleasure to introduce Birgit Close. Good morning, everybody, on this, it is May, but it could be March, but we are positive in West Michigan, right? And we are tough. Now you know why I get up every morning. It's for all those people who just got those awards. Um, that's what really gets me going for 22 years in this position. It's in, in spite of all the news that we hear, um, there are people during these difficult times, and Michigan has been experiencing them for a few years. There are companies like DeWitt Barrel who've been here for over 100 years and continue to be innovators. And we have innovators like HTI and Dorna Works, who were also two projects that we worked on at Right Place last year, who do it in spite of all the bad news. And so congratulations to everybody who was up here. Uh, you are what makes West Michigan uh, continue to grow and be successful. I appreciate all of that you do. And, and I'm, I, we were just talking, and it's been six years since you started this event, and it's been my privilege to come here um, for six years. And, um, and I certainly hope I continue to add something um, to the conversation of how do we move, restructure, reinnovate, reinvigorate our region. I can tell you this, and, and uh, as a friend of mine in the audience, uh, Ken Rizzio, he's been in economic development in the area for a long time. Um, we talked about before for, for breakfast that, in fact, we do have an awful lot to be grateful for in this area. This community in this region continue to be aspirational, and I really mean that, aspirational. From 100-year-old businesses who are still here to entrepreneurs who are starting, like Floriza, um, we continue to reinvent ourselves, from um, cutting down lumber and making fine furniture to becoming the office furniture capital of the world to becoming a bioscience region, we continue to reinvent ourselves. And the right place has been part of that reinvention for 25 years this year. And it was founded, as you know, just a short primer by a group of local business leaders um, in 1985. The first chairman of the board was Jay Van Andel. His son uh, continues the tradition. Um, we are still a private nonprofit led by a board that now includes President Haas. Um, and, and funded by investors who believe that we need a strategic plan that drives this region forward. And um, while we continue to have very difficult times in Michigan, and, and I do want to talk about how I believe personally and as an organization we can drive a different strategy, I do want to touch on what in fact the right place has accomplished just like those entrepreneurs this past year alone. Um, if Sometimes if you read the newspapers it sounds like nothing positive is happening and you could get downright depressed, but then you see the companies that were honored by the governor and by you this morning who continue to reinvest and who continue to make uh, job investments. And, um, and we are seeing <clears throat> very definitely companies in, in all parts of the in of industry beginning to see the light of day. Um, we have lots of projects in the pipeline, both local and non-local. And this past year, in, in 2009, we did $213 million of new investment. Now, you would think that in 2009 that would have been nearly impossible. But the projects that we did were in, across all sectors, from HTI, the, the people that you honored this morning, who are turning um, turkey waste into energy in northern Kent County, to the Donor Works Group, um, who is in aerospace and now medical device, to the Farmers Insurance Group, which to us is foremost insurance, which is investing $84 million. They could have gone to Oklahoma or Kansas. To Global Forex Trading, which could have been anywhere in the world. Good morning, Gary. Um, who could have been anywhere in the world. But they did it here. Um, and they did it because they believe in this community, but also because the state of Michigan and our regional partners offered them incentives. And in each case that we did with those $213 million, we competed with another state, except for one case. So the competition for those jobs is extremely strong. And so the question that we have before us is how do we reinvent and reinvigorate 
Michigan so that we can continue on the path of the jobs that we are creating and make it easier on those companies to make those decisions. Because if for farmers, we competed with Oklahoma and Kansas, um, with, with the Dorner Works. I know they looked at Cedar Rapids, Iowa, because Rockwell International is there. They looked at Arizona, because Honeywell is there. Um, but we kept them here, and that'll be 50 jobs. You may think, well, 50 jobs, but those are 50 high-tech jobs um, that are going to be created in this region rather than somewhere else. But we need to continuously look at how do we reposition this state in light of the changes, both in our own state, in the country, and globally. And believe me, the global, the last two years have not been easy, um, in, you know, given the uh, financial meltdown that we had. So what are some of the things that the right place is doing, and then what does the state do? Our mission is very simple. Retain, create, attract. Retain first. If we would have had left, lost Dorner Works, I'll pick on you this morning, um, to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, any other growth they would experience wouldn't be here. So retain, retain, retain first. We cannot expect a new company to locate here if somebody walks out the back door and they wonder, well, why did nobody take care of me? 80% of our new jobs still come from the companies that we have. We are marketing this region globally. In fact, in this lovely weather, I have a German company in here at 9.30 this morning. I have another one coming in in two weeks. And after chasing one for eight years, they finally made a decision to actually open an office here. So um, it's not an easy task marketing to new companies, but certainly we continue to do it. And we continue to get our fair share. But in a, in a world that is about as flat as it gets, and I know it's a, it's a cliche, um, it's very easy to Google anything that's going on anywhere in the planet today. And the debates that are going on in Lansing, whether we have incentives or don't have incentives, or whether we have tax restructuring or not, are very easy to look up anywhere, anytime. And you know, our competitors are looking, as well as people who are making decisions. We are about diversifying this regional economy. Um, advanced manufacturing continues to play a huge role. We gotta make something. You can't just sell each other whatever. Um, manufacturing, to me, remains one of our core competencies. And I talked to somebody at breakfast, and I won't mention your name, but he re moved his manufacturing plant back from North Carolina to here because they couldn't get it right. So if you need it made, you can make it here, and you can make it here extremely well. We have the workforce that we need to do this, okay? Um, and we have the engineering talent to do this, and we have engineering schools right here that can do this. But um, it's very, very critical that we remember only when you make something or when you sell something out of the state like a service do you create wealth. That is how wealth is created. So advanced manufacturing, clearly the biosciences. Um, if somebody would have told me, I've said this I think five times, that we would have a cluster on the hill as big as it is, I would have said you're crazy. But here we are, 14 years later, and it's growing. And we collaborate very closely with our friends in Kalamazoo who have a big bioscience cluster. In fact, we did it collaboratively last week um, in, um, at the bio show in, in Chicago. It, it sells much better when you can sell as a region. And I am talking about the region from here to the lakeshore and down to Kalamazoo. Now, I can't represent all my colleagues, but I can tell you they are working as hard at this as we are. Um, alternative and renewable energies. Yes, we will get wind energy in the state. Uh, on and offshore. Very controversial, I totally understand. But if you look at the industry, um, it, we have some of the best wind conditions in this country. Um, we have a renewable portfolio standard that we're going to have to live up to, and, um, and wind will be part of it. Not only wind, but a lot of wind. And we should be harnessing that wind. Um, on the other side of the state, in Saginaw, and uh, there's somebody here from Dow, um, a friend of mine who works with Hemlock Semiconductor, biggest supplier to the solar industry. And those are the kind of things that we need to do to reposition ourselves in this state. Um, so whether it's HDI and, and turning turkey waste into electricity to do anaerobic biodigesters, um, as Marek has done up in Muskegon, or wind energy. Alternative energy has to be part of the package. We cannot continuously do just oil. Um, it, defense and aerospace, Dorner Works is a good example. We're working with a company in Kentwood that five years ago had 100 employees and now have 600 employees in this, in this industry, and they're adding another 200. 
So, and food processing, a huge, huge industry in this area uh, that sometimes we tend to forget. Um, it is uh, agriculture is the second largest industry in Michigan, and food processors across this region are growing. Uh, Roscam Baking invest, is investing $60 million. Um, we are dealing with a project that I cannot mention by name yet, but will be hopefully announced next week that is in food processing industry and me will mean um, a very large investment uh, by a company from out of state that will grow another 150 jobs in food R&D here and make a huge investment. Keep your fingers crossed, hopefully next week we'll be done. But a very, very large industry. My friends on the lakeshore, um, two battery plants in Holland, a battery plant in, Mus in uh, Battle Creek and hopefully a German joint venture battery plant in Muskegon. Why did they come here? Um, the state put up um, a very aggressive incentive package and the feds uh, put up almost a billion and a half dollars to locate these plants here. But why Michigan? Why Michigan? The auto industry. It still plays a crucial role in this state and we should never forget it. If they had gone away and died, you would have seen a meltdown and we, our unemployment rate would be 25% plus. It creates the biggest our private R&D. Michigan, by the way, is the number one R&D state in, the, in private R&D in the country. Um, we have the largest cluster of engineering talent in southeast Michigan when it comes to, to, uh, to the auto industry. General Electric just uh, decided to create 1,200 engineering jobs in southeast Michigan for wind energy research. Um, our friends in southwest Michigan are doing a lot of things around the bio industry. MBI is growing um, and they did they really did a turnaround down there when they had a meltdown with Pfizer. So the entire region is working very, very hard at this. But what do we need, um, what do, we need to do to continue to move forward? Um, just as a sidebar, President Haas and I um, participate in the Regional Public Policy Forum. We had a meeting last week. For those of you who don't know, it's a group of local chambers, uh, um, organizations like Right Place, universities, as well as private sector leaders um, who two years ago came up with an agenda that basically uh, we had a big meeting, several hundred people decided here are our priorities for Lansing. Tax reform, regulatory reform, transportation funding for infrastructure, healthcare issues and right to work state. The latter one being a little tough. You would think that this is sort of um, motherhood and apple pie, who could be against this? They've worked very, very hard, and yet we've had very, very little movement from our legislative delegation. I don't know about you, President Haas, but it was one of those more frustrating things to have to listen to. Because I believe, and I think all of you believe, that we have the makings of a new state, that we in fact have the resources to move forward, but we have legislative gridlock in Lansing. Um, the five priorities, as far as I'm concerned, that we need to look at are, um, a common vision. I don't know about you, but I don't know of a company that doesn't have a vision to get it from A to B. The companies that were honored this morning have a vision and a plan. I don't know who said it, but if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And at the moment, I think the state lacks a vision and a plan. So I'm looking, I'm looking for the leaders that are wanting to get elected this year, um, and we will have 30 new senators and over 50 new House members. This is what term limits will do to you. A new governor, a new uh, secretary of state, and a new attorney general. So we have pretty much a new slate. So when they come to you this, this during the next few months and ask for your money and your vote, ask them what their economic development strategy is for the state. Ask them what their vision is for the state and ask them about their team that they're putting together. Because when you start a company or when you run a company, the team that you have with you will make all the difference in the world. So we need to have a common vision. We're in this boat called Michigan. We can either fix it or we can sink or swim together. Um, number two, systemic tax reform. Um, I've been around, unfortunately, long enough now in this business for over 30 years. They violated child labor laws back then, but um, uh, I, I have been in this business for over 30 years. I've been in this job for 22, and I have to tell you, I still love what I do. And I love what I do because of the people here this morning.
but I have, was also around when they created the SBT. Um, it was the most unusual tax in the country. We harangued about it for 30 years. Everybody called it the small business tax, even though it was not. But uh, the long and the short of it is we decided to do away with it. And what we created is something much worse. I still can't explain it. It is still the only tax of its kind in the country. Um, and it's very hard to compare the MBT to a tax in North Carolina or, or Mississippi or Ohio or name a state that we're competing against. Um, for two years, we've begged them to do away with the surcharge, and we still haven't made any, any headway. In my opinion, and in the opinion of many others, and I see President Haas nodding, the MBT needs to go. It's not just a tax reform. It needs to be, the entire tax code needs to be changed from top to bottom. We are operating under a tax code when this, country, when this state had a very, very different business infrastructure. Um, it, it, yet, what has changed, we are functioning in a very different world. So, and yet the tax code is, like many things in this state, still operating what, what was worth working 50, 60, 70 years ago. The way we collect our, the taxes for our, from our gasoline, that law was passed and the formula was created in 1951. That doesn't work anymore. Cars have become smarter, they give better gas mileage, and so on and so forth. So systemic tax reform. A commitment to education. Um, I'm sitting obviously in a university that celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. Congratulations. And who would have thought I wasn't living in this country? Uh, but who would have thought in this community who was here then that 50 years later you have one of the top universities in the country right here? It was the dream of a half a dozen people in a cornfield in Ottawa County. And here you are. What, how many students? 26,000? 24,000. And um, I know that they have more students they can handle as freshmen every year. It has become the university to go to. And when I talk to people on the east side of the state, they love sending their kids to this school. Um, but we keep blathering on about that education is our way out of this dilemma, but we keep cutting education and ed cutting education and cutting education, and I'm sure Tom is going to take a hit again um, in this coming budget. So how can we say on the one hand that a knowledge-based economy um, is going to be our way out when in fact we're not educating the people who can do that work? doesn't add up for me. On the other hand, we're spending more on corrections today than we do on higher ed. We're spending over $2 billion on keeping people incarcerated at $30,000 a year when you can at Grand Valley for the same money educate somebody. Think about it. It's actually cheaper to send somebody to Harvard than keep somebody in, in jail. Um, so until we... Re reconfigure, reconstruct, reinvent. We have to look at it differently. And yet the people of Michigan are more willing to spend money on keeping a criminal in jail than they are to educate a child. The state of Indiana figures out how many jails they have to build by the time a kid is eight years old because by their reading and their writing skills. So pre-K education is critical. Zero to five is one of the most critical things where we can invest our money. And there is a commission locally that is exactly taking on that issue. Because the child has to be ready to go into the first grade. And if they're not, the failure rate is very high. And you can tell who's not going to make it through school. And I know when they come to a university, often they have to do a lot of remedial training in reading and writing. That shouldn't happen. So if, if, if we don't do that right, um, I think we're going to have a very rough road. And frankly, I don't want to market West Virginia and I don't want to castigate a state. But do we want to be a sophisticated state with knowledge workers or don't we? And that has to do with education. In the 70s, when I started, when I came to this country and I started going to college, 70% of the money a university got for tuition came from state taxes. Today it's hovering around 40%? 18. 18? So can we really call them public universities? That is the question. They're becoming private universities. And 
so education is becoming less affordable, so less kids can go. So this whole idea of getting to be a knowledge economy around life sciences and alternative energy, to me, it just doesn't add up. So it's a vision, it's systemic tax change, it's education. Let me talk about infrastructure. Um, you gotta wanna be here. You know, when I go to Europe, I carry my own map and the Europeans look at me, what is she doing? <laughs> What's she do? Why is she holding up her hand? And so then I get the map out or I get the Google map out. I said, see, it's, it's, like a, it's like a hand, okay? But you have to wanna be here. There are only two peninsulas in this country, us and Florida. So, you know, if the rest of the country is pretty big block, so you need a really, really good transportation infrastructure to get you there, right? I mean, our roads are failing. Um, more freight is going to be handled by rail. Our ports are going to become more, ex more important as we talk about wind energy. And our airports are equally critical. So let me just take them one by one. Um, Michigan and every other state, uh, Michigan right now receives 92% back from federal funds for, for our infrastructure and other things. That means we are still a net donor state of eight cents. So for every dollar we send to Washington, we only get 92 cents back. South Carolina gets $2 back. So they get you know, double what we get, more than double what we get. Much smaller state, but they get 92 cents. They get over $2 back. Alaska gets 550. Much smaller state, um, you know, whatever, but we need to fight for that. Here's our problem. We will be losing $2 billion in federal highway funding over the next five years unless we can pass a four cents gas tax. And I know people said, well, I don't want to pay more taxes. Four cents is nothing. Um, we will lose $2 billion in highway funding, bridge repair funding, etc over the next five years unless we can raise the gas tax four cents so that we can get our matching money from Washington. If we don't, we will, become, we will get back 50 cents on every dollar we send to Washington and the two billion dollars will go to Illinois and Ohio and they will be happy to have it. And yet a coalition of business leaders community leaders, college presidents, economic development organizations, you name it, you name it, you name it, has been pleading for two years and we have made zero progress because it's an election year and four cents of a gas tax, it's taxes, 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 don't do that. And yet, how are we supposed to get the goods around that we are producing in the state and want to continue to produce? How is the talent supposed to get from A to B? If you're gonna to have to go to Allegan to go to work at Perigo, you still have to go on a road. So do we or do we not want to have an infrastructure that is world class? <laughs> I picked somebody up from the airport and I drive an Audi and I'm German, I have to have a German car. So the German asked me, why would you drive a nice car like that? Your roads are terrible and your speed limits are way too low. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm like, well, I still like the car. He said, it doesn't make any sense. So in any event, um, rail. Very, very important. Um, most recently, the right place and, and colleagues in Kalamazoo, we worked with um, uh, a, new, a new rail provider uh, from Grand Rapids to Elkhart, Indiana. It's called Grand Elk Railroad. It used to be Norfolk Southern, but they divested out of the state. Rail is becoming a very, very big issue. Um, and you, in fact, you can, you can run 436 miles on a gallon of gas uh, and uh, on a rail rather than on a truck, okay? So we are working with a number of very large companies between here and the lake sh and, and all the way to the Indiana border. It's a rail coalition um, that is looking at taking stuff off the road, off trucks and putting it on rail. Um, they're looking at gas prices. Um, they're looking at obviously cost related to that. And, um, and if you're looking at the, the wind energy industry, um, if you've ever looked at parts that make up a wind turbine, um, a blade is about uh, 50 meters or 150 feet. Uh, the tower in pieces is 300 feet. A gearbox weighs about 30 tons. So <clears throat> you A, need good roads who can carry the load, and you need rail in some cases to get it from A to B. And as I touched on a little bit, the Great Lakes states are the next big 
wind development area, and I mean all the states around the Great Lakes state, and Michigan being in the middle of it all um, and having the manufacturing capacity, we will see not only um, wind turbine farms, but we will also see manufacturers who are doing the parts and the pieces for those farms. So rail is very important, so are ports. We have one deep water port in Muskegon. Um, Ludington is not far behind, but we need to really keep those ports up. Um, and our lake, sh and you can bring goods all the way from, from Europe through the St. Lawrence, except for three months in the winter, all the way to Muskegon. And that's very critical when you're looking at bringing in large pieces and parts. In addition to which, of course, I believe that the Great Lakes are one of our largest assets. Um, so it's roads, it's rail, it's ports and airports. Um, it was one of the finest moments last week when we actually got AirTran to come here. Um, in the last few months, we've, we've been able to bring three low-cost carriers to our airport. I cannot begin to tell you how critical that is. Um, not only do we need the infrastructure of the airport, because we are doing a lot of international work. Um, there are 100 foreign-owned companies in this area. We're getting more, uh, but we also have companies that are very global that are asking every day, you know, how do I get from A to B? How, what's my connection to Detroit or Chicago to get overseas? Um, if you have a private plane, it's a little easier, but most of us don't have that luxury. We, are, we were the second most, most expensive airport in the country, uh, behind Huntsville, Alabama. Um, but just like attracting a business, attracting an airline takes a while. Um, in fact, I recall when AirTran came in a few months ago just to say we're coming, um, the gentleman uh, who came off the plane said, oh, we met before, yes, in October of 2004. And, um, and, but they weren't ready. Um, and I, I want to congratulate and thank Dick DeVos publicly for taking on uh, the West Michigan Regional Airlines, which is really people from all the way from Traverse City uh, to Kalamazoo and the Lakeshore to say we really need better air service. Because we, when, when you fly on a short notice to somewhere or your ticket, and many of you are driving to Detroit, and you're driving to Flint, I see heads nodding, or you're driving to downtown Chicago, uh, because a $1,000 ticket just doesn't make any sense. And, and as our legacy carriers are continuing to um, consolidate, you are having now a merger between Continental and United, you're having a, the merger between Northwest and Delta, you're going to have a merger between US Air and whoever's left over out there. So you're going to be down to three legacy carriers. And we were the only airport in a community of our size that did not have um, a low cost carriers. And now we have three, Allegiant, Frontier, and, and AirTran. And please use them because we need, as they call it, butts in seats um, to make this all th work, okay? Um, and um, so it's a very, very, very critical point. Um, let me touch on regional collaboration as the fifth point. And I mean collaboration across all, across all areas. The West Michigan Strategic Alliance recently celebrated its 10th anniversary, and they've really led the way with a lot of that. Um, the Right Place um, collaborates across a variety of issues. This game that we're in is a team sport. We don't do this alone. We collaborate with our municipalities. We collaborate with this university. We collaborate with our friends in Kalamazoo and on the lakeshore. It's all critical collaboration. The urban core mayors of this region are collaborating around issues of police and fire, of water and sewer, but they do need a little help from Lansing because there are laws that are literally holding us back in terms of that municipal collaboration. But you have to have, again, a common vision for that collaboration. And let me just tell you how that gets very, very difficult when we bring a company here. Every one of my communities, and I love my municipalities, we work with them enormously well. But every one of my communities has a, has a different tax abatement policy. So if I, if I work with company A and we show them a building in Wyoming and Walker and in Byron Center, each one of them has different rules. Well, to that company, even a local company, it's like, Scratch your head, why isn't this all the same? Aren't I all in West Michigan? And yes, you are. But, you know, everybody has different rules. Those are barriers. And companies today think regionally. I actually wanted to bring a map today and show you where we are in the world versus the rest of it. This is a, count, is a region of seven counties, 1.3 million people. 
and companies don't really care about political boundaries. The DeWitt Barrel people used to be right down the street here on this campus, and now they're in Marne. Well, to us, they're still a West Michigan company, they didn't go anywhere. They just moved a couple, you know, but they're in another county, who cares? They're still providing those jobs in West Michigan. This university is regional. It has campuses all over the place. So if we don't do that, then we will lose. We have to get over the fact that there is a political boundary someplace. Companies don't really care. And our, and our workforce region is 13 counties. Um, you know, traveling from here to Kalamazoo is 50 miles, big deal, and you know, that's about 50 minutes. In New Jersey, that's 10 miles. So we have to really get past this idea that we are, that we are different, okay? Um, we collaborated, uh, about three years ago I was approached by a group of HR vice presidents and you know, you market the area, help us market to new talent. Talent being a very, very big deal. Um, how to retain it and how to attract it. They wanted to know how to attract it because they weren't very successful. And since we do attraction um, of businesses, they wanted some help in how to position their companies in the region. And so we started a very long conversation that eventually started to include all the chambers of commerce, every economic development organization between here, the Lakeshore, and Kalamazoo, um, private sector-driven companies from, from uh, Wolverine Worldwide to Meyer to Amway. And the long and the short of it is, at the beginning of the year, we rolled out something called Queris. Interesting name. Uh, it's, it's housed within the leadership um, Grand Rapids, I should say the community um, Center for Community Leadership in Grand Valley just joined as an employer. And it's really employers coming together, sharing resumes, sharing information, um, to say to the talent, come here. And to be able to say, you know, I may not have a job for this person, but maybe Grand Valley does. Uh, there's a young woman in the audience today, she's German, and I won't pick on you, uh, Suzanne. Um, but we met her, we met her, her husband is a CFO of a German company, and she, she has her PhD in sociology. She's teaching at a community college, but she also wanted to teach at another university during the summer, and we networked her with Dean Williams, and she's teaching here this summer. That's what talent is sharing is all about. So we, are, we collaborate through our innovation works uh, group, uh, which we started uh, with a grant from um, Wired. We collaborate with Dante uh, in Innovation Works at Small Business Development Center every day of the week. We just did a joint SBIR program. So it's all about collaborating across different, different areas. And speaking of Innovation Works and entrepreneurship, it's a very, very, very big deal in, the, in our area. Um, the university just created an entrepreneurship and innovation program with which we are collaborating. But let me just touch on something that we also need then if we're going to deal with entrepreneurs. Um, and if in fact we want to create the next generation of wealth creators. And that's called venture capital. Um, we have a whole bunch of entrepreneurship programs that work well together, um, that have different aspects of it that, that collaborate. But at the end of the day, it always boils down to where am I going to get some money? And first you go to friends, families, and fools, you know, the three Fs, and that works okay for a while. Um, but then you really have to have um, investment. And we have, we have some, some starts of that. And the university did a, did a research uh, project not too long ago, and that was one of the big issues that came out of that analysis is how do we fund these early startups? Um, once you've gone past the family and, you know, grandma and your second mortgage on your home and so on and so forth. And it really means we have to do some serious venture capital investing, which means we ought to have a fund here. Kalamazoo has three. Um, why can't we do the same? And President Haas told me that, in fact, they're looking at um, some venture capital um, issues around their new entrepreneurship and innovation center, and congratulations. That is really, really critical. Yes, I know where to go, where people are with money in the area, but it needs to be somewhat more, more organized. And it is very, from my point of view, one of the critical pieces that is missing if we are in fact going to engage in innovation and entrepreneurship uh, to, to, move, to move us forward. Let me, let me I've, like I said, we need a vision, we need systemic tax reform, we need in investment in education, investment in infrastructure, and a common collaborative vision for our region. Um, I am still very, very positive on this state. 
Um, when you do this here for 30 years, um, you have to be. I'm a person, this glass is half full for me, not half empty. It's all about attitude as, as far as I'm concerned. And as I started off saying, this community is aspirational and tends to look at the world as half, as, as a half full glass rather than half empty. But we will continue to do our work, but what can you do? Because my organization represents every one of you in this room. Whether we work with an existing company or whether we go to Israel or China or Germany or Spain, when we talk about West Michigan and a good place to do business, I talk about all of you. Because at the end of the day, it's the institutions and the people in those institutions that make this, pardon me, the right place to do business. And so what can you do to help us? One, when you say something negative about this state or you go to a convention and, and somebody asks you, where are you from? I'm from Michigan. Everybody says, oh, and thinks that we are a basket case. Then you have to say, that's not entirely true. I come from a region that has, in fact, invested a billion dollars in the life sciences. We have entrepreneurs who are starting businesses. We have great universities that are investing in our students. So your attitude counts for something. The person you sit next to on an airplane either believes this is a good place to do business or you can change that attitude in about 10 seconds and they'll never look at us. Seriously, I mean that. So attitude is very, very important. We have, as I mentioned earlier, some of the best universities in the country. We have a workforce second to none. We have engineers that are phenomenal. We have, we have the Great Lakes the oil of the 21st century. And oh, by the way, wind turbines, when they fall over, they don't spew oil into our water. So think about that for a minute. You know, think about that. When people are against wind power, I'm like, well, you know, but they don't spew 200,000 gallons of oil into our lakes. Um, so we have the makings of going forward. But it's going to take all of you and all of us collectively to make Lansing understand what it is we need to drive the state forward. We have Rebecca Ryan here. She is a, an expert on talent and an expert on how to position your community for that talent. And she was here about two months ago and she asked the question, how do we create a region that the kids who are here and leave want to be homesick for? And that's the question we all have to ask ourselves and that we all have to answer collectively. So hold the people who are running for office accountable to that question. Thank you very much. And I would rather answer questions than just keep talking. So, oh boy. It's too early, it's, I answered everything, come on. There has to be, yes. Um, yes, Kurt. Yes, how are you doing that, Kurt? Um, you talked about those five issues that we're struggling with. Give me some comparative data to other states who are getting it, states that are doing it right. Any, any research? Well, we, uh, as a matter of fact, um, some of us are looking at, at, in fact, comparing some of those states. Um, let me just answer it this way. I work, Chief competitor states are um, Indiana, uh, to some degree Ohio, a number of the southern states, um, the Tennessees, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't hit on all points, so let me just uh, add a couple of other things. There is a current philosophy in Michigan that if we just cut business taxes to near nothing, Everybody will come. Let me tell you that is not an economic development strategy. That is part of the tactic, but that is not a strategy in and of itself. As I said, do we need systemic tax reform? Yes. It needs to be simpler and easier to explain. Okay? When I lay down our MBT versus Tennessee, it kind of, you know, people's eyes cross over. But the very same states that our, our biggest competitors not only do they have a different and more competitive tax structure, they also have the most aggressive incentives. And I didn't touch on incentives a lot because it's one of those subjects that where there are, you know, philosophies go this way. And it's, and it's the philosophies are getting 
more hardened. But I can tell you that it's an either, it's not an either or strategy anymore today. It's a this and. It's a competitive tax structure and a competitive incentive structure. And until and unless we have a national policy on business incentives, don't ask me to lay down my weapons because then I can't compete. And the projects that we did last year, like I said, every last one of them had um, an incentive package attached to it and would not have landed here if it hadn't. Uh, example is Texas. Texas a few years ago passed, not only does Texas have one of the most aggressive and best tax structures in the country, they also passed a law that allowed each community to raise 2% two, 2 of an additional sales tax. Each community individually could decide. So Abilene, Texas passed it and Dallas did and what it was strictly for economic development, both for running their organizations and for incentive packages. The state of Texas alone has a $295 million deal closing fund. Cash, cash. So when, when I hear politicians and potential politicians say, let's just cut taxes, great, uh, and let's do away with all of these incentives, I say, I'll become a real estate agent because that's all we're going to be doing. I can't be cutting a, a deal. And, and unfortunately, none of them have ever really sat across a table from a company that said, what are you going to do for me? The three biggest site consulting factors today are, according to a group of CEOs that was, um, that was uh, uh, surveyed last year, the following. Tax incentives, infrastructure, and a good workforce. Number one, two, and three. So our competitors whether it's Tennessee or Texas or Alabama or Mississippi, um, that's what they are putting t on the table today. So um, it varies across the board. We don't compete with East Coast states. We don't compete with West Coast states. We compete a little bit now with, with, the, with the Great Plains states for wind energy companies, but a lot of our competition still comes from the South. Um, and it's not just a union issue anymore, although that plays into it, uh, right to work states, but it has to do with both a tax system that works and an incentive system that works. So it's not either or, it's this and, okay? Um, the other thing that, that people are beginning to look at is what are you investing in education, as I already touched on. You know, we have 500 school districts in Michigan. Um, I'm not sure that's a sustainable that is sustainable. In Tennessee, for instance, they only do county school districts. Um, makes it very different. Um, and when VW was, was choosing a site, um, that played into it, not only that. Um, and speaking of VW, you know, it was between Michigan, Tennessee, and Alabama. Alabama fell off that list pretty quickly um, because of labor issues. It's a small state, um, not a well-trained labor force. But here's one of the reasons they went to Tennessee. And it wasn't our incentive package, which was very aggressive. And it wasn't the MBT, which they just kind of shook their head at, but they understand VAT taxes because they're German. But they looked at, they, well, value-added taxes are a big deal in Europe. So they have a 20% value-added tax in Germany. So that wasn't an issue. But what they looked at was our state legislature arguing over do we or don't we do away with the surcharge, do we or don't we have incentives, um, and can I count on them then to support me through my growth in the next five to ten years? And they decided no. So, you know, it used to be we could just all argue about these things in private, but today everything is on Google. And um, so how we handle going forward our issues of reform are becoming drivers in decision making for companies and site, cons and site consultants. And um, so the, the, the quicker we can fix some of these things, the better off we are. And it's very, very, um, I'm concerned that as, as these arguments drag on of you know this versus that and this versus that without that common vision and without that we gotta get this, this, and this done, that it will hurt the states um, image in turning, in turning a bad situation into a good situation. I, I know that was a very long answer to a short question. <laughs> Sorry about that, Kurt. Yes? I've got a question with the 
uh, Queers. Yeah. That you've started. Uh, there seems to be a lot of focus on that with talent attraction in Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard as much about talent retention or retraining of the current talent we have. It's more about bringing new talent in. Why is that? Well, I think um, and it, Carreras wasn't just started with um, with Right Place. It really today is a collaborative between the Right Place and Southwest Michigan First and every chamber, etc. It started with, and I'll get to your talent re retention in a moment. It started really with a lot of our larger employers who couldn't find the talent locally, reaching out to other parts of the country to bring a new CFO, an IT manager, a new doctor, et cetera, et cetera, and running into problems of you're re trying to recruit me to wear, you know, then you start talking about weather and all these other kind of things that over which you sometimes have no control. Um, and at the, so they really, really needed to reach out beyond the shores of Michigan and start attracting that talent here. Um, it's not just about talent re attraction, though. Um, it really is about talent retention as well. And obviously, you retain talent when you have good jobs. So that's the underlying issue. The retraining pro pro process is a whole nother um, kettle of fish, so to speak. We have in the area right now about 11% unemployment. And I met with a manufacturer a week ago who just hired 20 people for the shop floor. Um, their business is coming back. They're doing quite well. They have three business units. They're doing well in all three. So that was good news. So I said, so Tom, how difficult was it to find those 20 people? He said it was almost impossible. And now that's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? But our manufacturers today, from Roscam to whatever, to other companies, the, 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 the issue of training and retraining is becoming critical because they need very different skill sets today. You can't walk into AutoCam anymore without a high school diploma or, or better. So the state has a very interesting challenge, and so does the country in some ways, of what do we do with someone who has very little education has almost made a very, very good living, and that now has not the skills to go back as the economy is turning around and people are looking for different skill sets. Um, I don't have the full answer. There is a, a Michigan Works program, which does retraining of some of those workers. Um, the Department of Labor and Economic Growth has gotten a bucket load of money for retraining for uh, green jobs. The community college is part of that retraining infrastructure. Um, and then we have to fix, and then we need to acknowledge so that everybody can be a nurse. Um, so, so you have retention, attract, excuse me, retention, attraction, and retraining, all coming together. The other interesting thing that nobody wants to think about is that the boomers are starting to retire. I'm not; I would be too bored. But, um, but Michigan, in spite of its high unemployment right now, right now, in about five to eight years, is going to look at a labor, skilled labor shortage. And so we have to look at how do we train people to go into some of those skilled labor jobs. I don't think I answered your question completely, but those are issues that we as a state and a region have to wrestle with. OK? Yeah? Getting back to incentives, yeah. Michigan currently has the most aggressive incentive package for the film industry. But I was waiting. I was hoping we wouldn't get into this question. but. <laughs> Um, I can't fully answer that question. Um, I'm optimistic if, if, in fact, the film industry builds an infrastructure in Michigan. Okay? By infrastructure, I mean um, we have a project up here in Avistar Park that is a um, potential film studio. And that creates permanent jobs. So kids can learn how to be filmmakers or set designers or whatever. Where I don't think they're going to, uh, if they're going to look at incentives, um, is for just giving you 40% back when you make a movie for four days somewhere. Okay, and the reason is, and I'm going to be very honest because I would be, I would be not burger close if I weren't. Um, I am 
I am not a supporter of writing somebody a check just for making a movie for four days in a community. And let me tell you why. Um, they're not permanent jobs. It's like the circus coming to town. The Convention and Visitors Bureau sells this community to tourists and conventions who have three to four to five thousand room nights. That brings as much money to this community, new money, as a film production does for five or six days. So if we're going to be fair, why wouldn't we give the convention planners and those 5,000 conventioneers who fill up the DeVos Hall, DeVos Place, the same kind of a package? It creates the same kind of jobs at our hotels and at our restaurants. That's my question. I'm sorry that philosophically we don't agree on film tax credits. I agree with them if they, if they establish permanent uh, film studios or sound stages where people get permanent jobs that lead to wealth creation. But if it's just for four days and we'll write you a $40 million check for a $100 million investment, I don't think it's worth it. And, and those film credits have given us the heartburn with all the other tax incentives. And by the way, Iowa had more aggressive ones and they just did away with them all. Um, my concern is that if, if we don't take care of some of those credits, the credits for a bioscience company, an, an, an alternative energy company, the donor works company will go away too. Somewhere we're gonna have to figure out how to do this. So if it's permanent, I'm fine. If it's just the circus coming to town, to quote my friend from Kalamazoo, I'm not sure it's a good spending of our tax dollars. Yes? With your, your discussion about tax restructuring, has someone put together a program that would be beneficial to the state to go through that whole restructuring, or is it just wishing and nothing really that? Well, there, there's a group of, um, a group of uh, CEOs. It's called CEOs for Michigan. There are currently 70 members. Um, lots of names you would, rec you would uh, recognize. Um, many of them here from West Michigan, and if I start ma ma from Jim Hackett to Mark Bissell to Doug DeVos, you name it. Um, they have put together um, a plan for Michigan, which has 10 points in it. It's a little high level. We talked about it yesterday. Um, but tax restructuring is definitely in it. Has Anybody then put meat on the bones and said, here's what this would look like, outside of just saying we'll tax services? No. I, I really believe we need to look at every tax we have, and it's not just tax, it's also regulation, okay, that in a sense is a tax, and look at what it would take to, to continue to have the necessary funding to fix our roads and educate our children, but what is that mix? I still believe that the, the, the local chamber of commerce, when we went through the SBT MBT conversation, had one of the best plans around. Um, it looked at, I thought I was going to turn into an accountant for a while because I sat on the committee. But they, they looked at all of that. It was simpler, it was fairer, and yet it never went anywhere. But somewhere along the line, you have to start talking to the groups like the CEOs from Michigan, like the forum, the, the public forum that we're part of like um, the Michigan turnaround plan from the Center for Michigan and start looking at where, how do they all line up. Because I tell you what, nobody's going to like everything. In the end of the day, we don't want to pay taxes, you know? I mean, but at the end of the day, we also know we need to educate our children, we need to have an infrastructure that works. So how do we get there? The reason the SBT and the MBT were created because they give the state a relatively stable, you know, tax influx every year. I mean, that's, that's why it was created. But it was written 30 years later by the same guy who wrote the SBT in the 70s. So we just tweaked it around the edges and created something different. I think we really need a totally different tax that, that is easier to explain, easier to collect, has fewer loopholes, and you don't have to play games. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not a tax accountant, okay? But we really do need to look at the whole thing. The other thing is regulation. I mean. We're looking at permitting processes that take too long, uh, companies that don't get their permits, particularly the food processing companies. Um, it shouldn't take months. In, in Georgia, you have a six, 60 days and you got your permit, not six months. 
So there are a lot of things that we, that we need to do. And to me, I'm looking for somebody who has that plan, who have the vision for what Michigan wants to be in 20, 10, 10 years, and then say, here are the four or five things we need to do to get there, and here are the tactics, and I'm going to put the team together to make it happen. He's getting the hook. Thanks, and we have a gift packet here from Birgit. I'm going to be a GVSUer yet, you know. I am a Bronco at that. <laughs> well, that's what we're trying but to do. But we achieve. are an honorary GVSU grad, right? Right. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks. Thanks very much. All Thanks. Right. And I, I, I hate to cut off the questions at this point, but Birgit has agreed to stay around and answer any questions you might have out in the lobby. So let's please do that. I'd like to thank all of you again for coming out and for supporting us through this year. We'll see you in September. Thank you.